Ringa pakia. Vai vai takahia. So these very bright orange flowers and bright orange or pink flowers are not so common in New Zealand. So this is a flower of a small shrub and this is the only member of the Gesneriaceae family. This is Rhabdotamnus solandri and uh, it's a uh, very very unlike flower is uh, agrees very well with Gesneriaceae but when we look at the leaves of course the leaves are opposite but they are so dentate and also this uh, shrubby habit with uh, very thin stems which secondarily becomes uh, much uh, more thick due to cambium activity is not at all typical of most Gesneriaceae and uh, we know actually that in southern hemisphere there is one species this Rhabdotamnus solandri in New Zealand there is one species in southern Australia not in southern in eastern Australia and uh, in Chile also from this group of uh, uh, totally austral Gesneriaceae also there are few species with uh, Metraria, Sarmienta and uh, so it's a very very separate group of Gesneriaceae but very very beautiful We are in the Waipua rainforest. It's a temperate, a warm temperate rainforest because we are in the northern part of the North Island of New Zealand at a latitude about 34, 35 degrees south latitude, of course. And it's uh, temperate and very rainy because, of course, inside the ocean, southern ocean, uh, it's uh, raining a lot, a lot. And when, it's, when we see all the filmy ferns and uh, uh, growing not only on the stones but also growing epiphytically we see it's a lot of rain on forest since three years we know there is a lot of rain and uh, anyway now i stand just in front of the father of the forest it's a giant cowrie agatis australis it seems it's uh, due to the to the diameter which is more than five meters it is thought to be the oldest of the forest and estimate uh, around 2000 years many branches have been destroyed because of course there were many, many storms uh, did kill branches but the tree is still perfect 
quite profitable life because we see some branches which are totally perfectly covered with the leaves. So we see it, uh, it was a reiterative process because from the top of the trunk many new branches appear. Of course uh, this tree did withstand many many events, climatic events, so uh, some period of uh, drought of course, uh, some period very humid, some period warmer, some colder and still alive. The big problem of course is that there are very few parts of forest which are still well preserved. This is the biggest, the Waipua forest. And uh, so because all the car most of the Kauri trees have been cut by uh, the new immigrants in New Zealand and uh, only since uh, the late 50s it did begin to really stop and to protect the remaining patches of forest, but it's patches of forest. But anyway, it's very impressive to see all this cowrie. Here is a younger one, and uh, we can see the very beautiful design of the bark. And these cowrie trees are totally covered in epiphytic species. So mostly uh, the Astelia and Colospermum species, uh, close to Liliaceae family. And uh, so there are big, big tufts uh, of leaves and uh, fan shaped, espe especially for uh, Colospermum, fan shaped, so they retain a lot of uh, moisture and a lot of dead leaves, so they create huge amounts uh, of uh, humus, uh, very heavy. And uh, also we see some uh, Griselinia, some uh, also uh, Pseudopanax, Pseudopanax lightus, often begin its life as an epiphytic species. And along the trunk, otherwise, so Metrosideros are growing but also Fresinesia. Fresinesia banksi is everywhere. We can see it covering all the trees. And in this forest, of course, there are many, many ferns because due, due simply to the high level of humidity, many ferns, many tree ferns. One of the most beautiful is the Siatea medullaris with the black rachis of the rachis of the of the frond uh, but also there are many Dixonia species there is also a very small I don't know the name a very small tree fern not higher than one meter uh, filmy ferns abound uh, of course as it said due to humidity and the one is very very beautiful is a trichomanes reniforme reniforme because it's a, the leaf has the shape of a kidney it is very very beautiful and almost among all the very strange trees also, we can uh, look at the Dracophyllum. So Dracophyllum looks exactly like, uh, like a monocote, uh, like a pandanus for instance, or, uh, or cordyline, uh, or uh, dracaena. So it has uh, strap-shaped leaves, very narrow, but and with parallel nerves exactly like, uh, like monocotyledon, but actually when we look at the trunk, we see that the trunk on the branches and then the trunks become thicker and thicker, so this denotes the dicotyledonous aspect of this dracophyllum. This dracophyllum belongs to Epacridaceae, now uh, usually we speak only of Ericaceae, so the Ericaceus family. This is uh, the temperate, humid New Zealand, totally enfin, warm, temperate, humid New Zealand. Here is really pure stand of temperate rainforest. These pink leaves actually are not at all leaves but uh, the flattened twigs of Philocladus. Philocladus is a conifer and it doesn't at all look like a conifer but uh, like a, a decotyledonous tree with compound leaves but not at all. Everything is stems and uh, so we have a main stem in the middle and then small totally flattened stems laterally. Later they turn green or more or less yellowish, as in this specimen, but when it is totally growing in the shade, it is absolutely green, just as we can see on this other specimen here. So this is a huge Philocladus, because this, this species becomes totally a tree, one of the biggest in the genus.
the reddish and fleshy cones of the Philocladus. Pogonum scandens, wow. It should be close to Smilax, Ripogonum, but a very strong monocotyledonous vine. So it's a filmy fern of the genus Trichomanes and only one layer of cells and it is, all, it is totally translucent, almost transparent as we can see. And this is due to the fact that there is only one layer of cells. So of course water is absorbed from everywhere, from the top surface, under surface, also from the roots. And these plants, of course, are very sensitive to desiccation because as soon as the climate is dry, of course, they can wither. So it means to have so huge leaf when you have only one layer of cells, it means here it's always very, very humid. This is really the proof of this kind of climate. These mosses cover the trunk and are the perfect nursery for the seedlings of the very small seeded trees, such as these seedlings of conifer, probably Podocarpus dacridioides, or another Podocarpus sensulato. I'm among a superb population of Elatostema rugosum. It is a 
plant of the nettle family, urticaceae, but with no stinging air at all. And we see the perfect shape, fan shape of the leaves, typical of understory plants, which collect the light in the best way without overlapping of the leaves. The leaves are dentated, and here in New Zealand they call, they call it the New Zealand begonia, but actually because the leaves are asymmetric and dentate, but actually it's not at all a begonia. This is a green form with the young leaves green, but just here is the brown form. It's, I mean, the form in which the young leaves are totally brown and then later turn dark green. But this always remains uh, light green. This, I think, probably is a Laurelia, Laurelia Nova Zelandiae. Other species are growing in Chile. I, yes, the yes, smell is not so strong as in the Chilean species, but it's quite okay. Uh, also, uh, yes, the Ropalostilis sapida, the palm, the only palm from New Zealand, Ropalostilis sapida, is here. So we see in this place, on very few kilometers, we see many, many interesting species, and of course, many ferns, because New Zealand is very rich in fern species. So I try to leave this place and not damaging the so beautiful Elatostema stems just under the ripogonum stem Pseudopanax crassifolius with very narrow dentate leaves So humid, so much rain, so oh, yeah. many ferns. Right. Right. <laughs> Where are you two from? France, Paris. Oh, okay. The lighting has changed. C'est quoi ça Explique-moi ça. C'est donc un lichen, ça Ou c'est un... Oui, c'est un lichen. Lichen. A green... Uh, green uh, crusted... Uh, foliaceous, a green foliaceous lichen. Looking like... Like a hepatix. But not uh, so perfectly... Uh, Dichotomously branching. And more important, we see... The small... Discoid... Protuberance. Which will carry the spores of this lichen. So, we are on the way to Tarawera Falls in the Rotorua area. It's a volcanic 
area in the center of the North Island of New Zealand. And here, what is very exciting is this carpeting plant and this huge trunk. Actually, this is the same genus in the Myrtaceae, it is the genus Metrosideros. So in New Zealand, it's quite incredible because there are quite many species, about 12 species of Metrosideros, and we have three different biological types of uh, these Metrosideros. I mean, we have the trees like this one. This one, which is Metrosideros excelsa, usually it is growing along the sea, on the sea cliffs, in the very windy areas. And so, of course, the shape of the tree is often totally modified by the very strong winds. And we did see them in the north part of the North Island. And it's, uh, so it's, this uh, type of Metrosideros, like Excel, Metrosideros excelsa, is germinating on the soil, usually in quite well-lit area. And immediately, it creates a small tree. And it's very, very strange because in the Rotorua area, in the lakes area of, uh, around Rotorua, uh, the, this species is also growing on the edges of the forest. And now it's Christmas, we call it uh, here in New Zealand Christmas tree because it's flowering now at Christmas time and so the forest is totally covered with the red flowers of the canopy of this Metrosideros. And uh, another type of Metrosideros is germinating as an epiphyte so usually quite high on uh, the rimu trees, for instance, the, the Dacridium. This type germinating high on the tree, so it, uh, it becomes as a small shrub and then it sends downwards roots all along the trunk of the host tree. And then when uh, the root reaches the soil, it's, it is uh, so quite, <coughs> quite suddenly thickening. And often has also lateral embracing roots. It is more or less a strangler tree, not in the same way as the ficus, because usually they germinate on very old trees, very high, so often the tree is dying simply because it's old. But in some cases, of course, it is a little bit strangling. And we, we, we can see them also germinating on old uh, stumps of uh, uh, cut, cut, uh, cut trees in open areas. And in this case, we see uh, even uh, where the sheep uh, are just, just around in the lawns. And uh, in this case, we can see these Metrosideros with the roots uh, totally covering the uh, dead stump of uh, Agatis trees, for instance, Kauri trees in the, in the north of the island. And the third type, with also three or four species in this type, is the climbing type. So this looks like, uh, like a ferny foliage, a mossy foliage. And when we see opposite leaves, we could think about a rubiaceae, for instance, uh, some kind of psychotria in Asia. Not at all, it's uh, also a metrosideros. And it is climbing, usually on tree trunks. Here, for instance, we see it climbing. And this species usually don't become trees. They remain climbers and not very high, usually at five, six, seven, eight meters. They send lateral shoots, which uh, bear uh, flowers. Usually flowers are smaller, some are whitish, according to the species, some are whitish, some are pinkish, some are red also. But what is very spectacular is this, uh, this foliage and it has adventitious roots, which, uh, same as in the case of the ivy, which uh, allows the, the Metrosideros to climb along the tree. Here it's different because from it did reach the top of the boulder of the rock and now it is cascading, totally cascading like this. First time I see such an impressive carpet, uh, curtain is totally a, a green, totally green curtain because it's, uh, it's totally separate from, from the rocks. So it's a very, very, very special site. And we'll see, uh, I hope maybe we can see some inflorescence. And when we see this huge one, uh, the Metrosideros excelsa with all the dark pink flowers. Of course, these flowers are very interesting for the birds because a lot of nectar is produced and uh, many uh, birds uh, feeding on nectar are visiting the flowers, of course, and also some insects. 
So Metro Sideros is really a, a successful genus in New Zealand and actually we can say it's almost the only colorful flowers of New Zealand because otherwise most of the flowers are tiny things, whitish, uh, white or whitish or yellowish, uh, almost unnoticeable. But Metro Sideros are really the explosion of the fire in the forest of New Zealand. So, we'll try to reach the waterfall if it's not too far, nor too difficult to reach. And if we have time, but I'm sure we'll have.
What it is? It's, it's uh, probably a Selmesia, kind of daisy family. And there's the snow. And <laughs> it's not snow. <laughs> yeah, it's a French word is Grail, I don't remember the English. Uh, maybe we. Jean-Cian. We are in the Tongariro National Park with the Tongariro Volcano. It's uh, early summer, but uh, actually it's very cold. Uh, it was it, uh, between uh, 6 and 8 degrees, but of course when the sunshine is uh, here, it's, uh, it's okay. But uh, otherwise it's very cold. And here, so we see all these tussocks, so with, of course, many poissons, many grasses, many sedges, and also among the shrubs, the Dracophyllum, different species. This one with very narrow upward leaves, another one with much more recurved leaves. Uh, there are some hebes, of course, uh, the Selmisia, the Selmisia with the woolly underside of the leaves are here also, of course. Uh, among the shrubs also, the Pimilea with the very bright uh, white flowers. Uh, we see the color, typical New Zealand color. I mean, it's a pinkish, it's a yellowish, this type of color. But here we see also the forest. And the forest is dominated by notophagus species. And the most, com most common actually is a, with very tiny leaves is notophagus menziesi. It is very, very beautiful because the tiny leaves are uh, totally uh, oppressed on the plagiotropic horizontal branches. and. Uh, some erect parts are absolutely uh, very Japanese looking, but actually these notophagus amensiesi are the highest uh, uh, the species which reaches the highest level elevation because uh, the last ones are at uh, about 1,500 meters elevation in quite protected areas. Of course, in the understory of the Notophagus forest, there are many species. The Astelia are very carpeting and are very, very prominent uh, here. Uh, of course, there are uh, also among the ferns, there's very beautiful Stichirus, uh, some strange plant, a small Coriaria also, which uh, looks exactly like a fern. It's uh, Cor Coriaria pteridoides. Uh, it's a uh, quite toxic plant especially the fruits are very toxic in all coriarias. Um, so um, the Pseudopanax, uh, uh, especially Pseudopanax colensoi, is very, very beautiful with totally uh, indentated leaves. And one of the most spectacular plants, of course, is a Cordyline indivisa. And it is uh, somewhat uh, recalling the high altitude species, uh, like, in, like in the Andes, for instance, the Espeletia in the Andes, or uh, also in the mountains of uh, Africa. All these monocolous trees, uh, like uh, the Senecio in the mountains, like uh, Mount Ruanzori, for instance. So all these plants with a very thick trunk, all the dead leaves remaining on protecting the trunk from desiccation and from, from uh, overheating sometimes during the day and also from cool, very cold weather at night and during winter. And this is Cordyline indivisa, as the name so can suggest, have only one trunk and very wide leaves and are very, very spectacular. And in some way very tropical looking in spite of the fact that they withstand temperatures which are around minus 10 degrees in winter.
a very strange moss with a stem like a trunk, like a black trunk, and all the lateral stems from the top. It looks exactly like a conifer seedling, but actually it is moss, or it could also look like a lycopodium, but no, it is a moss. So this uh, orchid looks like an arizema in the Arase because of the shape like a cobra and also the lines green and white and the long elements so one petal at the top with the orange tip and lateral petals also on each side also terminating in orange tip and flower in the middle, we can see the steel. Our ovary, of course, as in all orchids, is just under under the flower itself. I think maybe it's a pleurostilis, but I have to check if this is actually the good genus. This is a dwarf conifer, totally prostrate at the surface of the ground, so protected from <coughs> heavy wind and also some frost. And we see that under the leaves, which are under the upper up one, upper ones, are dark green. So the first upper ones are burnt a little bit by the sun, but this color is actually very beautiful. I look if there are some cones. Uh, no, it's growing, but difficult to know if it's new leaves or cones. Maybe cones. Ah, oh, yes, here we can see. At the, here you can see the tiny female flower just at the end of my nail. Here in the axilla. And uh, here are. Uh, a fruit here, typical of Podocarpus, fleshy, fleshy base of the fruit. Natural vertical garden totally covered in ferns, black gnome species, in cordyline, probably it is cordyline pumilio.
Rubus squarosus with only the main vein of the leaflet and the yellow spines. Actually it becomes a quite strong liana because the stems reach up to some centimeters and I think up to 8 or 10 centimeters in diameter. Very powerful spines, just as you can see on my hand. So this is a Macropiper excelsum. It's a shrub and also sometimes a small tree because it can reach about six meters high. It is very particular with the almost blackish stems. As we can see here, and also peciole, very dark peciole. It is often eaten, it is toxic, but actually it is often eaten by the, by the caterpillar of a moth, which is totally adapted to eat this micropiper. What is very interesting in this forest in New Zealand, it's almost the same as in most southern hemisphere forest. I mean, you have on the soil many, many fern species, eh, both the filmy ferns and other kind, uh, kind of group of ferns and uh, also tree ferns, so very rich in ferns. But actually, among angiosperm, it's very, very poor. Probably because this uh, temperate uh, rainforest of the southern hemisphere are always uh, very small patches and during the quaternary a period of ice and then the warmer period, uh, about 10 times uh, during the last uh, 2 million years, probably as this rainforest are so reduced, so there were only very few patches. And of course for ferns it's very easy to colonize again new habitats when it becomes warmer during the interglacial period. So for the spores they can spread very quickly and very far when the forest is uh, coming out of the Probably mostly in gullies, very protected gullies, there were the temperate rainforest eh, because it was Iceland in many, many places. But for angiosperm, of course, with very, very narrow uh, spaces, they have not so many chances to survive during the glacial period. And this is true for all of these very restricted southern hemisphere temperate rainforest. So probably angiosperm were sometime before the tertiary era much more diversified than now, but now in the understory it's very difficult, of course, for all the species growing outside the forest, which are the wind pollinated and also many seeds are wind dispersed or dispersed by birds, so it's uh, much easier to recolonize new areas. But for the understory it was too much reduced compared, of course, to the uh, more open places and we see that the diversification of angiosperms is mostly among trees in the rainforest and among shrubs in open areas. But herbaceous plants in the rainforest understory are very, very poorly represented. And uh, this is very exciting to see these uh, similarities between Southern America, Southern Africa also in the uh, temperate rainforest where we have also one piper, for instance, in Southern African forest and Tasmania, Australia and then New Zealand. So it's, uh, it's poor, but uh, sometimes when it's not rich, it's very exciting to try to understand why it is not rich. So we'll go on, we'll go on.
Urtica ferox, the most uh, poisonous of all uh, the nettles. Uh, so different from the Elatostemon pilea, which have no stinging hairs at all, but here we can see the stingy, the white stinging hairs. It seems that some children died when they tried to catch their balloon among these nettles, but maybe it's not sure. But sure, it's very dangerous. Different, totally different leaf shapes on the same plant. Sometimes it's two opposite leaves here. One is brown linear, the other has two lobes. These two opposite are reniform, head shaped. These no limb, no blade. This little blade at the end. It's incredible. It's uh, the Ascipiadaceae climbing. This is very, very beautiful shape. But on the same plant, all this succession of different leaves with no, no, no sequence, uh, easy to understand. Les vaches sont encore radilinées. Oh, une cordeline. Wellington, 3 janvier 2013. Tout ça pour finir Et notre âme, et notre âme Est-elle immortelle ou pas, cher plaisir Rime et rame, ir et arre Feindre ou peindre, cindre, geindre Et gémir dans les cartes Les marlisées, notre 
notre sang et nos souvenirs. Oh madame, oh madame, oh madame Ogarita, l'avenir, 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 ce n'est pas encore tout ça pour finir. Et notre âme, et notre âme, est-elle immortelle ou pas, cher plaisir Mais notre âme, à notre âme, immortelle ou pas, est-elle pour finir 